It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 137, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Sean Kuhn of Vitruvian Farms raises about five acres of vegetables with his business partner, Tommy Stouffer, in McFarland, Wisconsin, just outside of Madison. Vitruvian Farms raises a little bit of everything and a whole lot of salad greens, so we dig into the ins and the outs of producing 1,200 pounds of salad greens a week, from bed shaping and weed control through harvest and delivery. John shares the way they have and have not mechanized their salad production and how they make this intensive level of production work on a small scale. We also look at the key success factors for their other main crops, oyster mushrooms, tomatoes, and microgreens. Most of Vitruvian Farms produce is sold through 45 restaurants in Madison, and Sean shares how they got started in that marketplace and how they maintain those relationships. We dig into what quality really means when selling to restaurants and how Vitruvian Farms gets top-notch produce to demanding chefs in a crowded marketplace. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is generously supported by CoolBot by Store It Cold. You can build an affordable walk-in cooler powered by a CoolBot and a window air conditioning unit. Save up to 83% on upfront costs and up to 42% on monthly electrical bills compared to conventional cooling systems. And by Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop-growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high-quality compost and compost-based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com And by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on the farm. Gear-driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSAmerica.com Sean Kuhn, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Thanks for having me. So glad you could join us here today. It's it's kind of funny to be talking to you down in McFarland, Wisconsin. I've got you on on Skype here doing the recording. You're only 15 minutes away from me, but uh, the way I've got my technology set up, it's actually easier to do it over the internet. For sure. I'd like to start off today by having you tell us about Vitruvian Farms. Where are you guys located and how much are you farming and, and what are you growing and how long you've been doing it? Yeah. So it's a farm that I and a couple of friends started um, right out of college uh, in 2011. And uh, we're located about seven miles south of Madison. And we're a certified organic kind of mixed vegetable operation with a couple hogs and laying hens and a couple odds and ends stuff. Um, We do a small CSA, one farmer's market. And we sell the bulk of our business is we sell a lot of wholesale salad greens, to uh, restaurants and a couple of groceries in downtown Madison and the surrounding area. So I always tell people we grow a little bit of everything and a lot of salad greens. I like that. You guys got started in 2011 and there were actually three of you. You said when you graduated from college, that was here at the University of Wisconsin, right? In Madison? That's right. And did you study horticulture or, or something related to this field or were you... Yeah, I was a philosophy and psychology major, actually. There's a lot of organic vegetable farmers who were philosophy majors. Yeah, you just start, uh, you start thinking about things. And uh, at least for me, uh, we wanted to do something that felt right and had some meaning behind it. And I think you could argue organic farming can be that. You said that you guys are selling to, I think, 45 restaurants and retail establishments in Madison. I mean, Madison's not a big city. I mean, 45 restaurants, that's a, that's a fair proportion of what's here. It's a lot. Yeah, Madison definitely has uh, a really advanced local food scene. Um, I'm not exactly sure why it's developed that way, um, but uh, we've, we've sold a little bit in Chicago, and we're going to be looking to expand into Milwaukee, actually, this fall. But when you start looking at other cities in the area, Madison just, as even for its size, it blows the other cities out of the water in terms of how many chefs and restaurants are willing to pay more money for high quality, locally produced, produced food. Um, we didn't exactly know that right when we started the farm. Um, we had an inkling of it, but we kind of look at it as a very fortunate thing that we started the farm here because I think there's a lot of other areas around the country and, and it's even in the state where it would have been a lot harder to find customers uh, in the way that we did. I know that Madison for a long time has often referred to itself as an island in a sea of reality. Yeah, I've definitely heard that. When you started, did you intend to go after that restaurant and retail marketplace 
Or did you guys start off doing farmer's market and CSA like so many farmers do? Yeah, we kind of started, uh, we didn't know this at the time, but yeah, we kind of started on the, on the opposite end of the spectrum. Whereas I think a lot of farms start with the farmer's market and the CSA. We actually started with the restaurants. We didn't know that that was going to be so difficult, I guess. Um, but I think we just, we would just kind of had the mindset that restaurants would be higher volumes, more consistency. So we, we kind of started off with that. And what it ended up doing was um, it kind of just pushed our quality um, to a really high level because we always thought we had to have the best stuff because we were sending it to these fancy restaurants and these chefs. Um, and then only later on, we decided to start marketing directly to individuals with our CSA and the farmer's market. When you guys are marketing those restaurants and retail establishments, you're taking your own deliveries there. You're not doing that through a co-op or a food hub or anything like that. Yep. We are delivering in downtown Madison twice a week. Um, my business partner is actually out delivering uh, right now. Um, and we got, uh, we actually started off with a home built uh, refrigerated van, had a cool bot unit on it and a little generator and air conditioner. And this year we actually bought a full on refrigerated truck. We like having the opportunity to walk the product into the restaurants ourselves and, you know, make small, small talk with the chefs and have that connection, I think is, is what this is kind of about. It's not just the food, but it's also the fact that it's a circle of support between the restaurants and the farmers and it's friendship. It's a lot of different things. So we really like doing it that way. I'm just curious, did you guys start off with a refrigerated vehicle? Because a lot of times, if you're located so close to your market, people don't see that as being a necessity. At the very beginning, we were delivering in our cars with just uh, air conditioning blasting. Um, I, I, I guess I would say we've always been pretty paranoid about, uh, about food not being refrigerated. So uh, I do know a lot of other people make a lot longer deliveries without refrigeration, but especially because we were doing a lot of salad greens. We just wanted to keep that quality as fresh as possible. So I would say we, we, we made a refrigerated van about two and a half years into our farming career. I mean, not to, not to get too nuts and bolts right off the bat, but tell me a little bit about that refrigerated van. I mean, a refrigerated truck, of course, is a, I mean, it's a refrigerated truck. You buy that as a package. How did you guys go about refrigerating a cargo van? Yeah, so we just kind of insulated. Uh, we did a foam insulation and then just a wood box on the inside of the van. And then it's basically a lot. Of, I know a lot of people will understand what the cool about is. Uh, we got an air conditioning unit that's mounted with the rear end facing out. And then there's a cabinet on the back of the door with a little Honda generator that powers the AC unit. And the cool bot basically tricks the AC unit into acting more like a commercial cooler. So we can actually get it down to, depending on the temperature outside, between 40 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit inside. And that was an installation that you guys did yourselves? Yeah, we did that after we, we got it costed out. For a company um, estimated it would, it would cost like $8,000 to make our van into a refrigerated vehicle. And starting a farm with a tight budget, we didn't have the money to do that. So we did that setup for a lot less. Okay, so a tight budget. That's another thing with starting a farm straight out of college. How did you guys finance your startup? We gathered uh, a small amount of startup capital, mostly from um, ourselves and our close family. And uh, about a year and a half, two years into it, we graduated onto one of the FSA microloans. And that actually allowed us to buy a couple pieces of equipment. So we started off right away using a lot of the funds to build a bunch of uh, high tunnels. And then uh, after that, we moved to buying a tractor and a couple other pieces of equipment. Tell me about the production systems there at Vitruvian Farms. You mentioned I a mean, tractor scale operation with, um, I think you said five acres of vegetables, and then, and then you've got some high tunnels. Can you kind of flesh out what that looks like for us? Right now, we have about uh, 10,000 square feet of high tunnels. Um, they're all uh, trellis, uh, or, or about half of it that space is um, trellis greenhouse tomatoes during the summer. Um, and we use the, all the high tunnels for um, early spring and late fall salad mix production. And then we've got about three or so acres outside devoted almost strictly towards 
um, all of our baby leaf salad greens, everything um, from the lettuces, the spinach, uh, arugula, mizunas, different brassicas, and then probably about an acre to two acres or so devoted to CSA crops. Um, and for the salad, we're turning the land over at least two um, two times per year. Um, we're using a tractor. We're using a 45 horsepower tractor to um, do our primary tillage with a rototiller or with a chisel plow. And then we come through with the rototiller and pull a bed shaper behind it from Buckeye Tractor. Um, we're utilizing a lot of stale bedding. We're growing all of the salad on 45-inch bed tops. And uh, we have a couple harvesting uh, pieces of harvesting equipment. Harvesting is one of the major jobs on a baby green um, production. So uh, we started every- doing everything with just hand cutting with uh, knives and graduated to the quick cut harvester made by Farmer's Friend. And then we actually bought um, the uh, Harvest Star. It's a push harvester made by Sun Ag. Um, and we're actually just in the stages now of, of looking to uh, go up one further step um, in terms of harvesters just because of how much labor it can save. Yeah, most of our, we don't have a ton of uh, processing equipment. What we do have is all geared towards salad, salad mix. Um, so we had a couple of pieces of equipment custom fabricated for us, um, including a baby greens washer uh, with a bug reel and then uh, a baby greens um, air dryer, which is a big conveyor belt and a couple fans that move air from below the greens to to get them really dry. Um, But otherwise, our our washing system is pretty pretty much just uh, done by hand. So I'd like to circle back and actually talk about your salad mix production from start to finish, because I know that I know that for using the kinds of harvest tools that you're talking about, and I want to, I want to make sure that we, we take time to describe each of those tools for the listeners. You, you've got to do a solid bed first. You know, that's a really important piece right there. That's a, it's not, you're not looking at three rows of salad greens, 15 inches apart. You're looking at, at really a solid bed of greens. Yeah. You said you guys are doing raised beds using the Buckeye bed shaper. What happens next? Well, how are you getting the seeds in the ground? Yeah, so um, we're planting with the Johnny's uh, six-row precision seeder. So that's just a hand-pushed seeder that um, can lay up to six rows, based about uh, two and a quarter inches apart at a time. And so we, do, we end up doing about three passes on our raised bed with the six-row seeder. So a lot of the salad greens are 18 rows, on the 42, sometimes 45 inch wide bed. And, and then the weed control for that pretty much has to be done in advance, right? Yeah, we definitely try to knock out most of the weeds with the stale bedding process. So after we shape the beds, um, we're looking to irrigate those for at least two, but hopefully three weeks to get that flush of weeds germinated. And then we come through and just really shallowly cultivate with uh, a rototiller trying not to go, you know, more than two inches deep. And then um, once we do plant and the crops are 10 to 14 days old, we come through with a really thorough hand weeding. And then everything is also given a final pre-weed immediately before the harvest. So there's a lot of, a lot of hand weeding that goes into the salad greens, even when you're doing a stale bedding. I remember back in the mid nineties, talking to the folks at Red Cardinal Farm up in, up in Stillwater, Minnesota. And they were one of the first farms to really ramp up the salad mix production and try to mechanize that here uh, in the upper Midwest. And they talked about how when they got a mechanical harvester, they had thought that the harvesting was the weak link in their operation. And what they discovered once they got the harvester, it was, it was actually the weed control that was the weak link in their operation. Because the mechanical harvesting, of course, you're harvesting all the weeds. Yep. So then when you come in to, to harvest, you mentioned a couple of tools for that. You mentioned the, the, it's the farmer's friend. And that's, the, that's that one that's got the rotating brushes and it's powered by a cordless drill, right? Yep. Powered by a cordless drill. It's got a reciprocating stainless steel blade on it. And then it's got a revolving macrame brush. So as you're 
as the blade is reciprocating, the brush is kind of gently pushing the greens into this little basket. And then he dumps the, the greens into a bin after that. How quickly are you able to harvest greens with that tool? Uh, it's a pretty decent jump up. I would say we were doing um, maybe around 20 pounds, maybe 30 pounds an hour by hand um, with a knife. And when we jumped up to the quick cut harvester, um, someone who's really moving could probably do 100 to 120 pounds an hour pretty conservatively. And where does that fit on the, the skill level? scale is it something that you can turn over to just anybody or is, or is it something that you really have to have an experienced operator for it, there's definitely a lot of little nuances um with it i mean the basic concept is pretty simple and anyone can go out and use it pretty much immediately what takes uh a lot of knowledge is knowing we, we do a lot of recuttings on our farm and so if you cut that there's a multiple a number of ways in which you can cut the crop too big or too small and then kind of ruin the next harvest. So in terms of the basic concept, it's pretty easy in terms of doing it on a professional level. It actually doesn't take a decent amount of training. If you're managing salad mix for recut, and I'm a little bit surprised to hear that since you're going for that high end, high quality marketplace, because the the concern there is that you end up with, with rotten leaves from the last cut or, or you end up with bits and nubs. How, how do you get that right? Yeah, that's, that's really just a matter of being really particular with um, the first cutting. Um, and um, I mean, that's pretty much the majority of it. It's, we're really particular with the first cutting. So getting the stems, um, you know, a half, half inch to an inch left on the ground and, and leaving as little plant material debris behind from that first cutting is what allows you to have a good second cutting, sometimes even a third cutting. But we are really particular with what we bring in. So it's allowed us to push out a really good product, even though we're doing second and third cuttings. And it's a lot more, um, it's a lot more efficient to do it that way, that, at least that we've found. So then tell me about the Harvest Star harvester that you, that you mentioned, that you, guys, you, that you guys upgraded to. Yeah, that's a, that's a push harvester. That's basically it's on two large um, wheels and it's got a a, a bandsaw blade um, and then it's got a conveyor belt and you basically push the harvester right on top of the bed and the greens move up the conveyor belt and fall into two baskets and basically you have one operator um, harvesting and pushing the greens in the basket and then another staff member is grabbing the bins and, and running them towards a refrigerated vehicle. You actually have the refrigerated vehicle right out there in the field. Yeah, we're, we're, we're throwing the greens immediately into a refrigerated van um, during the harvest. Um, we basically have just found, you know, the longer uh, or the less amount of time that they spend in the heat, the longer they last. And what was the deciding factor for moving up to that Harvestar Harvester. Like, the, the quick cut greens harvesters are can be quite hard on your back. Um, when you see someone using it, it the first thing you think of is um, that that's probably hurting your back. And I would say uh, we have a lot of younger staff on the farm, uh, and it's a lot of staff that's normally only here for a year, so normally it doesn't it doesn't create a problem, but um, when I and some of the other founders were using them, it can eventually take a toll if you don't have like a perfect form um, when you're harvesting. So we wanted something you could harvest the greens standing up um, and then also something that would harvest them much faster. And I would say the, the harvest star, we can harvest probably two to 300 pounds an hour um, compared to, you know, 100 to 120 pounds an hour with the quick cut harvester. When you say two to three hundred pounds an hour, is that two to three hundred pounds an hour per person, or is just two two to three hundred hour, two to three hundred pounds in as as per tool? Yeah, like it's it's two to three hundred pounds for about a a person to do. Did you find that there were differences in what was required in terms of the the actual culture or leading up to the harvest? between those two harvesting tools in terms of what you had to do to get that bed ready to harvest? Not really. 
the, the one thing is uh, sometimes we come through um, with an alley cultivator uh, to get the weeds growing in the alleys between the beds, and those uh, that that implement can uh, push dirt up kind of onto the ridges of, or the side of the bed to create a little ridge. You have to keep that from happening if you're using the harvest charge is because you end up pushing the blade through a bunch of soil. Okay. But overall, it's pretty much the same setup as we do with the, with the mini harvesters. Do you mind sharing what kind of an investment you had into that harvest star? The harvest star we bought used. Um, so it was right around $8,000. Um, I think brand new, they go for between twelve to 14000 so you've really got to have some dedication to doing the salad production and doing it in these solid beds and having those weed-free beds before you go out and purchase that kind of a tool. Yeah, absolutely. And you got to have a, a really solid market. Um, I think we we didn't uh, we didn't buy that harvester until we were doing like six or seven hundred pounds of salad greens a week, and with plans to do a lot more. So it definitely takes a a decent amount of production to justify that piece of equipment. How many pounds of Sally Greens are you guys doing a week now? So this year, um, we were doing, during peak production, we kind of hit a, a bit of a, we do a little bit less in the summer just because it's a lot more difficult to do a lot of these cold loving plants uh, mid-year. But during the, the height of the growing season in spring and fall, we're doing over 1,200 pounds a week um, between salad mix, baby arugula, and baby spinach. And we are looking to bump that up to maybe 1,500 pounds or so this fall um, as we start exploring um, a couple new customers, potentially in Milwaukee. That's no small amount of salad greens. Yeah, it's, it's a decent amount. You guys are harvesting the greens. The greens are, are coming into these plastic totes. You're putting them straight into the, the refrigerated truck out in the field. That vehicle comes in. You're unloading them in the packing shed. What happens next? So next, they are. Um, we kind of put a, a little bit of uh, water, wash water, right on top of them, just to, um, to get a little bit of evaporative cooling going, um, take a little bit of the heat off, and then they're 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 organized and stacked into our walk-in cooler, um, and then we we wash the whole harvest in a series of batches, uh, just because it's it's so much we can't wash it all at once. So um, we separate the greens out, um, so you have a nice diversity in each mix. And then they, they get an initial wash in an old uh, stainless steel milk bulk tank. And then they go, they get transferred by hand into, um, or someone's scooping them into our custom built salad washer. And that's pushing the greens under uh, a large bug reel. So it's a little contraption that pushes the greens underwater, and a stream of water brings any floating objects uh, out of the mix into a little drain. Then we take the greens and put them into um, one of two uh, salad spinners, 20-gallon salad spinners, to get the majority of the water off. After they're spun, they're emptied onto our uh, food-grade salad greens dryer, which is a big conveyor belt with a bunch of fans pushing air from underneath the salad with a bunch of dehumidifiers actually running in the room so that we can get the final um, packaging dryness that we found really helps the greens last a long time. Then we're packaged in the three pound bags, boxed and stored in the fridge, shipped out the next day to all of our customers. And you guys only do the bulk salad greens. You're not doing any packaging in clamshells or, or individual retail bags. We're only putting a small amount of stuff into retail bags for the farmer's market and our farm pickup. We are not currently licensed for doing consumer uh, packaging for like a grocery. So every everything that we sell to a grocery is, is sold bulk and then they handle the salad greens. So that's one of the things we might, when we build a new building, we might scale up and start doing um, consumer ready packaging. Talk to me about, about weather with these greens. I mean, I feel like the last two years in particular have been uh, in the upper Midwest dominated by extremely wet springs and kind of crazy weather throughout the summer. With salad greens, your your seeding schedule is pretty rigorous. I mean, how are you guys making that work with the crazy weather that we've been having lately? Yeah, uh, I guess, you know, the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is I look at the weather. Um, 
it's with using the precision feeder, um, we're feeding the salad greens twice a week, every week from, um, I think this year we started the end of March all the way until I'll be finished in about a week or two. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of planting to, uh, to do every single week. And we're just, uh, just trying to manage the soil moisture as best as we can. Sometimes the planting gets moved around by a day or two. Once in a blue moon, we have to skip a planting just because it's, the soil is too waterlogged for too long of a time. Um, but basically, we're, we have the raised beds, which allows the soil to, to dry out if it's, if it's been really wet. And we try to come through there and lightly stir up the soil with the rototiller um, just a little bit so it can dry out by the end of the day and hopefully plant. But with the salad greens, you, you really are at the whim of the weather sometimes. Um, they're a really fragile crop, and there's at least, I would say, one storm a year that you end up losing a lot of, a lot of the leaves to. They get damaged by hail or, or heavy rain. And um, we're just trying to, we try to insulate ourselves from those things um, as much as possible um, by moving the harvest date around. So if we think a heavy storm is coming, we might harvest something just a little bit earlier um, or, or push the harvest back slightly because, uh, to, to let the damage kind of heal. And I suppose that's something where the investment that you made in the mechanical harvesting makes that kind of shuffling around a little bit easier just because you're that much more efficient with getting the harvesting done. It's not like you have to shift an entire day's work out of the way in order to move that harvest date around. Yeah. Um, the harvest typically takes the first um, three or four hours out of the day. Um, and that's kind of the idea with thinking about moving up another notch is that we could theoretically get harvest done a little bit faster um, and try to avoid those extreme weather events if need be. How are you managing pests out in your salad greens? I mean, you know, flea beetles are such a problem here, uh, and I think almost everywhere for salad greens producers. What are you guys doing to keep that under control? At the beginning, uh, flea beetle is pretty much the only pest we seriously worry about with the salad greens. Um, pretty much everything else is in and out before any pest problems develop. So we used to fight that with uh, the insect barrier, the Agrabon lightweight. Uh, row covers that you put over the crop and you physically exclude the flea beetles from entering the brassicas. Um, we kind of moved away from that, um, both because we were getting a lot of, a lot of damping off, a lot of, um, a lot of beds that were too wet. Um, and also those, uh, those row covers just create an immense amount of plastic waste. They're made out of of woven plastic material, and we really didn't like how much waste we were creating. So um, we looked into our organic um, biological pesticide, and we, we really like using Entrust for the for the flea beetles. Um, and we haven't. They've honestly, it seems like they've gotten less bad throughout the years. And I don't know if that's because we're doing a good job of managing some buffer strips and keeping some some space. Uh, on the farm for beneficial insects or if it's because of some reason like that. But we, we mainly can control them with Entrust, and we only have to u- utilize that a couple times per year. And that's basically just uh, a fermented bacteria um, that you spray on the crop. And then on your Instagram page, I think I saw a picture of you guys using shade cloth out in the field to keep the crops cool during the summertime. Yep, yep, that's a, that's an, uh, something that we've been thinking about for a while, and it's just something that we've never really gotten around to, to doing. Um, so we're, we started playing around with it this year, and I think next year we're going to actually try to build a major shade cloth system for the middle of the year. Um, like I said before, we, you know, all these salad crops are really cold-loving um, crops. They really, a lot of them germinate a lot better when it's cooler. So mid-year, there's normally a little bit of a slump, and we're looking for any way we can to close the gap on that and have a more consistent supply. And I think utilizing some 30% um, shade cloth seemed to work pretty well so far. So I think we'll, we'll build some more of that next year. With your customer base, with being restaurants in a, in a hip town like Madison, 
have you guys had any pressure towards getting a, a GAP certification or any sort of a food safety audit done there? We, I would say the majority of the pressure on that is internal. It's something that we've looked into and we've got some consultation from a professor at the UW. We, we didn't have a conversation with the distributor once about what it would take to, to sell to them. And they, they asked for GAP certification. So that's something I think we're just going to um, naturally build up to uh, probably after we build a new facility. Um, we're, we're, we're still actually, we're renting our land right now. So the first step is, is purchasing either this piece of land or another piece and then kind of settling down there for good. Um, and then building a processing facility that's up to full gap code. And that would allow us to do a lot of other things as well. But, um, no one's, no one specifically asked for it. It's, uh, it's just something that, that we see as a good idea and something that some future expansion might require. Just on the subject of, of kind of labeling and what customers are asking for in that regard, I noticed that you guys didn't become certified organic until 2016. Why did you wait so long? It was definitely a matter of time and money, I would say. Starting the farm has been a, a, an immense amount of work. We, we started it literally from scratch. Um, none of us had a uh, farming experience. None of our family, uh, immediate family was farmers either. So we, we literally started from nothing. And that, there's, a, there's a really big learning curve there. You know, we started following the organic practices uh, a number of years beforehand, but just didn't have the time to kind of take the final step, nor really the, the demand. One of the interesting things is that a lot of the restaurants that we deal with really prefer to buy local food when possible, but organic is really not a huge priority for them. And I think part of the reason is that a lot of people um, conflate the local and organic idea and just assume that people who are growing locally are organic, which is obviously not, not the case. Um, so we didn't have a lot of restaurants really demanding it. Um, we, did, we did have a couple of groceries um, some co-ops that, that really wanted us to have a certification. So there wasn't a huge push from our customer base uh, to get that. It was more something we just really wanted to do. And again, your restaurant sales far outpace what you're doing to the retail food establishments, to the, to the food co-ops, really. I mean, you guys have 40 restaurants and just a couple of food co-ops, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean, the bulk majority is all going to restaurants. When you guys started the farm, did you intend to be as focused as you are on salad greens? Was that something that you guys identified as a need in the market in 2011? No. When, uh, when we first started, um, we really did not have any idea of which products would be successful. Um, and going back to um, how, much, how little we knew, I basically just bought a little bit of everything from Johnny selected seeds the first year that we, that we planted and planted a lot of things, including weird things that I, I didn't even know what they were like borage. Um, and about midway through the season, we were looking around at what looked sellable. And we just had this one, this one row of, of a mixed lettuce um, that we had planted that looked really good. And we cut it and begged it. Um, brought it into who became our first customer and they just, they liked it. And we, it was kind of after that, that we started learning salad mix um, really worked as a local product because you could sell it on um, its freshness factor because there's such a noticeable difference with greens that are harvested the day prior um, with greens that were shipped from far away and most likely already a week old by the time you get them. Um, we started catching on that salad would be a really easy thing to expand into with the uh, restaurants and they keep, they kept demanding more. So we kind of slowly moved into it more and more. So let's talk a little bit about marketing to restaurants. How did you break into that market in the first place? And then, and then how have you continued to expand your presence in that marketplace over the last six years? It was, uh, it was really, really difficult at the beginning. It started with a lot of cold calling restaurants. Um, and Normally, when you call a restaurant, you end up talking to the host or hostess. And when you ask them if you can talk to their chef, 
there, uh, there's usually a lot of confusion that happens. Um, and so it kind of evolved from calling restaurants to just kind of showing up with products and eventually it evolved into me showing up at the back door of restaurants uh, with a bunch of free samples. And I learned that when you show up, um, as long as it's not during rush hours with a bunch of free samples, the chef is normally happy to see you. And um, we, we picked up customers pretty slowly over the first couple of years. And um, about, I would say about two years ago, it kind of shifted to the point where we started getting calls from restaurants that had heard about us and knew about us and wanted to bring our stuff in. So it was a really, um, it was a really steep curve to get into the restaurant market, but then a lot of restaurants start putting your name on the menu and a lot more people start hearing about you and it's become easier now when a restaurant opens in Madison and does local food. A lot of times we'll get a call from them, which we're really grateful for. I think it is, it's something that is, is both a blessing and a curse working with the restaurant marketplace is that it's a small world and everybody knows everybody else. Yeah, absolutely. We've been lucky, lucky enough to establish really good relationships um, with pretty much everyone that we work with. So, so far we've got a really good, good thing going with those, with this community. Well, so do you live on the farm? No, I, I actually live downtown in downtown Madison. So we kind of have the reverse. We, we live downtown and we commute out to the country to work on the farm. And you mentioned that it's rented ground. And I think you said about a total of 10 acres or so, five acres of crops and then, and then some additional pasture ground. Yeah, about that. And that's all encompassed on about a 45 acre parcel of land. So we're actually utilizing about, about 10 acres total between everything. How did you guys find 10 acres of ground to rent that close to Madison? Because, I mean, if you're in Madison, you can hardly turn a corner here without running into an organic vegetable farmer. It seems like there would be a ton of demand for, for any small parcel of land that was available. I, I think it was just a matter of luck. The very first year we started, we were on a separate piece of land. It was someone that we got hooked up with through the land link program at the Farley Center. And uh, so we did one season, which was actually in Wanakee, a little bit away, away from here. And we were thinking about taking on another business partner, which would have allowed us to purchase land right away. And um, this person notified us that this piece of land that we're now currently on was for sale. Um, we looked at it with the realtor, didn't buy it, but when it was sold, the, the gentleman who bought it uh, contacted us and asked, asked us if we wanted to, to, to use the farmland in the back, and we said yes, and that's how we got here. And you must have some pretty nice flat land for doing the kind of salad mix production that you're talking about. There's a decent amount of slope out here. It's flat enough for us to, to work it, but there's definitely a, there's a little bit of a, of a hill going on back here. You mentioned, you know, this idea of, of bringing on a business partner. Now, you actually started with yourself and two friends, right? Yeah. At the, well, at the beginning, technically, there was, uh, there was four of us total. So there was myself and three friends. Um, and one person exited early on. And then uh, Tommy, Craig, and I did the majority of the building of the farm until Craig, Craig, was, uh, Craig left, decided that, that farming wasn't for him, and that was about the end of last year. So now it's just Tommy and I that uh, own and manage the farm. So how did you guys structure a business that you owned with four people and then allowing for the opportunity for people to come and go from that partnership? We structured it as an LLC, and I'm not sure if I would have done it that way. I mean, looking back, I, wouldn't, uh, I don't think starting a small business um, with four people is necessarily a good idea. It's a lot of different visions and a lot of different ideas or, you know, thoughts on how things should be done. But uh, we, we structured everyone leaving as, as small buyouts. But and how did you solve that visioning issue? I mean, I, I think about the challenges that oftentimes exist even between spouses, people that are, that are that close and that aligned. I think it would be really much more challenging to try to get that vision straight and uh, and kind of divide up the responsibilities and the accountabilities with a group of friends. Yeah, um, I guess we just kind of fell into our own little niches on the farm and honestly been a learning process of just 
figuring out how to make different ideas melt together um, when there's a lot of different ways you can go. With that, we're going to stop here, take a quick break, get a quick word from a couple of sponsors, and then we'll be right back with Sean Kuhn from Vitruvian Farms in McFarland, Wisconsin. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is generously supported by Store It Cold's CoolBot. The CoolBot has changed the way that farmers think about cooling facilities for their vegetables by making it possible to cool a walk-in cooler with a window air conditioning unit with massive savings on the front end and an ongoing electricity and maintenance costs. And now they've taken another step forward and created a turnkey refrigeration solution, an energy efficient walk-in cooler designed for easy assembly by you in hours, not days. And I know from experience how much time and energy can go into building a not so great homemade walk-in cooler, still gives me nightmares, or looking for a used one that's still in good condition. Save yourself time and money, Make your produce stand out in the marketplace when it lasts on store shelves, in restaurant walk-ins, and in your customer's refrigerator drawers because you sold it to them cold. If purchasing the CoolBot, please use the code FTF at checkout to double your CoolBot warranty at no charge or mention Farmer to Farmer and receive an exclusive discount on your walk-in cooler. Storeitcold.com. Perennial support for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is provided by Vermont Compost Company, makers of Fort V and Fort Light potting mixes for certified organic transplant production. And while it's hard to think about next year's potting soil in the middle of the current season, you don't want to miss participating in Vermont Compost Company's fall pre-buy program. When you order Vermont Compost potting soil for next year's growing season, you now you can save significantly on the finest potting soil that I have ever used. There are many great options for significant savings. Vermont Compost Company organizes shared truckload weeks when they organize in group orders by state or by region. And when you place your order to ship on one of these shared truckloads, they offer discounts on the purchase of your potting soil. Plus, because they consolidate the orders, growers save significantly on shipping fees. Or to get the best deal possible on Vermont Compost potting soil, order a full truckload. And if you don't need a full truckload yourself, get together with your farming friends and neighbors and order a full truckload together. Visit their website for more information, vermontcompost.com. All right, and we're back with Sean Kuhn from Vitruvian Farms in McFarland, Wisconsin. So, Sean, we talked a lot about salad greens in the first half of our conversation. What other crops do you guys focus on for sales to your restaurant accounts? So we're also growing a pretty decent amount of, uh, of tomatoes, uh, cherry tomatoes, slicing, sauce tomatoes, a lot of heirloom tomatoes. Um, we're doing a couple hundred pounds a week um, of those to restaurants. And we also sell uh, some oyster mushrooms. And we sell a decent amount of microgreens, uh, which is kind of a newer part of our farm. So mushrooms, I mean, that's something that's completely different from vegetables. I mean, I can understand, you know, microgreens have a different production cycle and a different set of constraints on it than, than growing crops in the ground outside does. Or even growing, you know, the same thing could be said of of growing tomatoes in the high tunnels. But mushrooms is a complete departure. How does that fit into your operation? Yeah, it's uh, it's something that we got into uh, just because there are a lot more um, vegetable growers around here than there are uh, mushroom growers. So we thought there would be an opportunity there to grow some, some gourmet cultivated mushrooms. Um, right now, we're we're growing almost exclusively oyster mushrooms. And uh, we're, we grow them by pasteurizing um, certified organic straw. Uh, so you heat that to 165 degrees or so for about an hour. And then we, we pack the straw intermixed with, uh, with uh, grain spawn or the little mushroom mycelium into some, into some polyethylene bags. And we hang them in a, in a mushroom room that's uh, humidity and and temperature controlled and we harvest mushrooms a couple times a week and sell those to um, some of our restaurant customers. Has that been a popular item for your restaurant customers? Yeah, we definitely could be growing a lot more. Uh, the only limit limitation right now is we don't have enough space um, because they're not something you could just grow outside. They really do need to be in a humidity controlled area. Um, either a you know a covered greenhouse type deal or a in, in, an inside room, and we're hoping to build more space because there's a lot a lot of other mushrooms that we'd like to be growing as well that we don't have space for. And is that something that you're doing year round, or is that only in sync with your outdoor production cycle? 
the mushrooms we're actually doing year round. So because those are inside of our processing building um, in their own space, we're able to, since we keep that whole space heated, we're able to keep um, pushing my, pushing the mushrooms out all year. You mentioned also, so kind of, I mean, kind of going out from something that like the mushrooms, which is, I, th- I would think of as being very controlled because you've got it in a, a completely enclosed building, heat and humidity controlled. So the microgreens, you said you've gotten into the microgreens relatively recently, right? Yeah, we, we really started doing it on scale about last fall. We kind of got into them last, we were talking about weather before, last summer was not very kind to us. So we, we had a couple of, of weather incidents um, and we ended up losing a lot of salad in the middle part of the year. And so we were looking for something that we could plant in a short amount of time and get some return to recover some of those losses from. And, and microgreens had always been on our mind, um, but we just never really saw a pathway into the market. Um, and last year we just decided to push it. And uh, we found a really fortunate customer with the UW Hospital they, uh, they actually purchased a lot of our microgreens for their salad bar and started exploring some of our restaurants and selling live trays. And now we, uh, we grow a lot of microgreens in a controlled uh, greenhouse. And we do those year round as well. That's a nice way to keep the cash flowing through the winter time. Exactly. Have you guys done the sorts of mechanization with the microgreens that you've done with your outdoor salad mix production? The microgreens is pretty much all by hand. We think it's pretty efficient uh, doing it on the scale that we are right now, just keeping it by hand. Just talking about going through the winter kind of brings me to, to the question of, are you guys an economically viable operation? Do you guys, are you, you and Tommy making a living from Vitruvian Farms? This is the first year where I would say that is, that's pretty true. Tommy and I have definitely been taking out as little as necessary to live, to squeak by, I would say, uh, which is definitely difficult when you're working a lot. Um, and you're also, on top of that, not bringing home a, a big paycheck. But this is the first year where the main goal has been to solidify our own personal finances and, and start taking home what you consider a normal paycheck, I guess. So, uh, yeah, I would say at this point, we are, we're looking good on a profitability basis. There's just there's just so much infrastructure that it takes to start a farm from scratch. And I think that's why it has taken a number of growing seasons. But we're also, um, we, we have a number of full-time staff hired. Um, and we pay them about as well as we, we think we can right now. So we're starting to come into um, a, good, a good zone, I would say, financially. The staff that you have on your farm, are they year round to match your year round production or do you guys really contract during the winter time? There's definitely a big contraction. Most of the staff starts around uh, mid May. They start filtering out. We actually just had the first one leave last week. They start filtering out around this time. And then we only keep on as many as we need. This, this will be the first year that we're trying to keep one of our staff members with us. Um, it's definitely a struggle to get people to return and there's a huge benefit there not having to retrain people every single year. So we're trying to keep enough things, enough income going through the winter that uh, hopefully one day we can have all of our managers work straight through the winter um, and, and retain them for every year. Now I would think that in a place like Madison, where there are so many organic vegetable farms and and frankly, so many really great organic vegetable farms that it would be hard to find employees to come and work on your farm because there are so many options for people to pursue. It hasn't really been too difficult. We, a lot of, a lot of the people that work um, on a seasonal basis are students. So they're, and they're, they're also the people not necessarily um, looking to do agriculture long-term. Some of them are. Um, but there's a lot of people just with an interest in learning more about where the food comes from and how this farming thing works. I think a lot of them don't necessarily expect it to be as difficult as it is. We didn't either. Um, but we haven't really had a problem finding student labor, I guess you would call it. A lot of farm owners complain about the quality of labor that they're able to find. And, and exactly what you said, you know, people don't expect to work that hard. 
do you feel like being relatively fresh out of school and, and having come to it without a lot of experience, does that give you a little bit more sympathy or empathy with the employees that you hire and, and make you a little bit more tolerant of some of the vagaries that you might have with hiring young people? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I definitely think we're at the point where when, when people say it's difficult to find good help, um, we can definitely feel out why they think that's true. I think we've always taken the stance that there, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of effects that the management can have on the culture of the workers, and I especially always take it upon myself to say, you know, if, if something is repeatedly not being done correctly, how can we design a better system or give better directions or create a better work culture so that those things happen? Um, because I believe you can get really good work out of people. It's just a matter of, of motivating them um, and getting them to see the bigger picture and then rewarding them um, when it's deserved. And then I did want to pivot back and talk a little bit more about your tomato production. That was something you said was an important crop on your farm for the restaurant sales. And, and you guys have, you said half of your 10,000 square feet of high tunnels in tomato production. Yep. We are, uh, we're trellising them. We got a lean and lower system going on. Um, the first year we're doing that. Typically, in previous years, we've always cleared out the tomatoes around this time to do a fall planting of salad greens. And this is going to be the first year where we try to push the tomatoes um, as long as they can stay viable in the greenhouses. Um, but yeah, tomatoes are another one where there's there's a really strong market for, for quality um, when restaurants can get the really good heirloom tomatoes. Um, and and we've, we've just had a lot of demand for that crop over other things that we've grown. So when you say that people are looking for quality in tomatoes, what does that look like for a restaurant? Um, with, with a lot of the heirlooms, they're just really prone to a lot of physical defects that can lead to like a lot of cracking, a lot of scarring um, that can really diminish the quality if they're not managed properly with water, with the nutrients. So uh, we're just trying to sell, you know, really... I guess intact, not scarred, not not cracked. Heirloom tomatoes of varieties that people find the taste and the texture to be of high quality as well. So, what kinds of things are you doing to avoid the cracking and the scarring? Definitely, I would say. I mean, the number one thing is just by having them under the greenhouses. Those tomatoes and some of a lot of the other tomatoes when they're grown outside. Um, number one, they're a lot more prone to disease, and we're not. We're not spraying anything organic or otherwise to keep fungal issues off of our tomatoes. Just by keeping them under cover and keeping the, the ground dry and the leaves trimmed from the bottom, um, we can mitigate pretty much all of the, the normal fungal attack that you'd have to deal with with tomatoes. Um, and then we're just, you know, we're able to manage the amount of water that they get so they don't swell and, and blow up during a heavy rainstorm. Yeah, and then just keeping the tomatoes really pruned and, and producing as efficiently as they can. And are you harvesting those and holding them or do you pick them dead ripe and deliver them right away? We, we harvest them at a couple of different stages, but after they've started ripening, uh, we normally harvest them. And that's kind of a key point with a lot of the heirloom tomatoes. If you, if you try to wait until they're a hundred percent ripe, by that time, most likely uh, the tomato, something bad has happened to the tomato. So we try to harvest, um, at some point after they've started ripening on the vine, and then we let them ripen up on, on their own in a controlled environment. So you said that you're not doing any, any sort of sprays of, of organic or otherwise for disease control in the greenhouse. Are you guys encountering other pest problems in the greenhouse, and how are you dealing with those? Yeah, definitely the biggest, um, the biggest pest problem is uh, the tomato hornworm and then the tomato fruit worm. And we're also, we're not spraying anything for those. Uh, I did introduce some beneficial insects, some of the parasitoid wasps um, we bought in a little while ago. Ideally, we would have put those in the greenhouses a lot earlier in the season, but kind of just have to, have to run with it. But most of the control comes from finding the, the caterpillars and just uh, manually taking them off the plant and getting rid of them versus trying to use any sprays or anything like that. And then the other biggest issue that we have to deal with with the tomatoes is fighting blossom end rot. Blossom end rot is normally related to calcium and water. And with, uh, with our irrigation, we're, we're using drip line uh, water from a well. And the well 
just so happens to be really, really alkaline, really full of calcium carbonate. We've done a lot of soil testing and it's pushed the calcium levels of our soil so high. Uh, it's also pushed the alkalinity of our soil up to, I've read uh, a pH of eight in one of our greenhouses. And when you get to that point, the tomatoes really have a difficult time um, utilizing the calcium in the soil and distributing it properly. So that's one of the things we're, we're always trying to uh, mitigate. And we normally do that by adding elemental sulfur to the greenhouse. It's one of the few ways you can organically try to lower the pH of your soil. You oftentimes hear about water out in the Central Valley changing the composition of the soils out there. I don't often think of that as being an issue uh, here in the upper Midwest. Yeah. Um, I think uh, the soil is naturally just a little more alkaline out here, but one thing we've noticed, it seems that the more we irrigate our soil, the higher the pH goes. Uh, normally farmers, or a lot of farmers, have to deal with the opposite problem. Well, and I guess that makes sense with the, with the limestone underlayment that we're generally dealing with here in, in Wisconsin, or at least in southern Wisconsin. Exactly. Well, I guess that, that brings us to an interesting topic. I mean, you talk about something like salad mix where you're you're doing two or three crops a year and multiple cuttings on each of those crops out in the field. And then, you know, in the high tunnels, um, obviously doing stuff like greenhouse tomatoes, you're pushing a lot of product off of the farm. How are you guys managing your soil fertility? So um, at the beginning, uh, we used a lot of, uh, we added a lot of rock minerals to the soil, a lot of rock phosphate and green sand. Um, and we used to use a, um, alfalfa pellets, organic alfalfa pellets as our main source of nitrogen. Uh, but now we're actually utilizing um, a fertilizer made by Sustain. Uh, I think it's uh, 524. And that's basically a composted circulator. And that's giving us a lot of our nitrogen and potassium. And then we're utilizing a lot of purple cow compost. Um, we're adding that at about 20 tons per acre per year, doing that to try to keep the organic matter levels high and trying to keep the uh, the micronutrients up as well. So you're not doing composting on the farm. This is, when you talk about 20 tons to the acre, this is stuff that you're purchasing in. You're right. We're buying that in. It's way more than we could produce. And I mean, and 20 tons to the acre, that's a lot of compost. It's, it's definitely a generous amount. We, we've we noticed that we're, we're on a, a dodge built loam soil here. It, it feels pretty heavy, kind of like a clay. Um, and we've noticed that having a generous amount of, of compost, especially towards the top of the bed, really helps to minimize the amount of crusting that happens. And with a lot of the rainstorms that we get and heavy soil, if, if the soil crusts over, a lot of the little salad crops have a really tough time breaking through that crust. So by having that extra compost there, we've noticed it really helps get the, the crop germinated. You mentioned that you're irrigating out of a well. What are you using for an irrigation system? Because for those salad greens, I mean, irrigation is almost everything with that, that timely water to keep that. I mean, you can, you can seed as often as you want. If you don't put water on it, you're not going to keep right. those crops running on time. Yeah, well, this uh, the property we're on used to be a tree nursery. So the guy that had built the tree nursery um, had a fairly large system set up for irrigating outside, and we kind of tapped into that. And we do, we do most of our watering is overhead, which is pretty, I would say, a necessity for the, the uh, multi-row salad crop. But uh, a lot of it's just uh, manually opening valves and, and, and switching valves around um, by hand. And with the overhead, are you just using traditional rainbird sprinklers with the ch -ch 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 set out in the field? Sure. Or are you doing anything different with that? There, most of them are impact heads yep, that, that have that, that similar action that we bought from a, a farm supply store. We've experimented with a couple other ones like wobblers and whatnot, but the, the, uh, the rotating 360 degree impact sprinklers work pretty well for us. In a lot of your advertising materials on your website, you talk about being a permaculture farm. And I don't normally think of intensive salad green production and permaculture farm in the same thought. Can you talk a little bit about what being a permaculture farm means in your context and, and how that fits into your vision? For sure. Yeah, definitely. I would say um, I started catching on the idea of perma permaculture, you know, kind of almost right after we started the farm. We knew we wanted to do organic and permaculture has kind of grown out of that. Permaculture is kind of the more 
the long term vision of our farm and, and what that means for us is just looking at the entire the entire system of the farm how do we take care of the soil um, as best we can and how do we take care of the people that are working here um, as best as we can and in terms of how does that intermix with salad greens um, we're looking at we're looking at um, intermixing our salad greens production with with um, perennial crops so kind of Similar to like an alley cropping system, um, we're trying to find how we can we can grow you know the annual crops that we need to grow for our cash flow, um, along with soil preserving crops that are trees or shrubs that are planted for a long time, so that we can decrease the amount of erosion, um, create a windbreak, create beneficial insect um, habitat, and uh, still produce a food crop from. Um, but kind of move away from just having fields of only annual crops and have at least intermixed. And as we grow as a farm, um, I think we, we plan on moving more and more into in a tree, co- tree crops of various kinds. And we're, we're really just playing around right now and, and getting our feet wet um, with the perennials. But the whole idea is just how can we turn over the soil as little as possible and produce food from it. So um, it's kind of a long-term idea and we're really at the beginning stages of doing it. Because you're on rented ground and you mentioned that you're looking to make that situation either there or someplace else, a more permanent land tenure situation at some point in the near future. Are there things that you're doing differently because you're on rented ground? I would say not exactly. We've definitely put in some some infrastructure that you really wouldn't want to do unless you own it, but sometimes you just have to make that hard decision um, and cross your fingers. Uh, part of the reason we want to buy the land is because we do want to do a lot more long-term infrastructure here, and we do have about a quarter acre orchard planted. For for me, I look at it as, you know, we could plant that orchard, and maybe in a couple of years or year we lose it. You know, if this isn't the piece of property that we settled down on, but um, I'm a self learner, and I look at those that those couple of years as time to make the the easy mistakes. And when we're, when we're ready to put the roots down for the farm on a permanent piece of property, we'll have a better knowledge base to draw from. So we're kind of you know trying to find a middle ground um, whenever possible. We're not investing stupidly on land that we don't own, but sometimes you have to have some infrastructure to make a, a farm with production like ours work. So the, the restaurants and the retail establishments really form the, I guess, the foundation of your marketing model. But you've also added a CSA recently, and you've got a farmer's market that you guys do in Monona, which is a town that's pretty much still part of Madison. How do those fit into your business, and why did you decide to do those in addition to focusing on those the restaurant retail establishments? Well, with the CSA, there's, uh, there's definitely the financial bonus. Um, of having some cash flow right at the beginning of the season to work with, um, especially because with our restaurant customers, um, when we're planting late February in the greenhouses and harvesting uh, the first crops in April, we have 30-day terms, um, and restaurants are are known for not always paying on time. So we we had this large gap uh, between working and actually having money to spend or pay ourselves with. So we really like the aspect of the CSA for that. But I would say more importantly, um, we really just, we're looking to connect with people. And part of the reason we started the farm was to was to use food as a gathering point for a community. Uh, food has, has uh, kind of always been that in the past. And, and one of the things we noticed in college was that there's been a de-emphasis on eating together or at least spending quality time eating meals together and you know that can have ramifications in the rest of our society so we're trying to bring people back together around the farm around the food and selling the food directly to them was the obvious way to to uh to to make that happen um and we yeah we really like just seeing the end uh customer and and talking with them and, and and spreading knowledge about what we're doing and a lot of people are curious about food today, and that was that was one of our goals. So I think that really helped help us fulfill that. So how has having a CSA changed your farm this year? 
the CSA really increased the amount of diversity of crops that were growing. And each, it, so I would say it really increases the, the amount of difficulty um, because it seems like every crop has its own specific nuances, things you got to know, you know, past uh, soil fertility issues and whatnot. So it really keeps us on our toes in terms of, um, of knowing what we're doing out here, it increases the difficulty a little bit. And there's a lot of planning that it adds on to our year um, during the winter months, trying to schedule out, you know, to have 20 weeks worth of boxes, have a good amount of variety and, and all crops that take different amounts of time to come to fruition, planning those out in succession takes a lot of time. So a lot more planning and a little bit more difficulty, but I think overall we really like learning all the different, all the different vegetables and, and fruit that you can grow. Having a, a more diverse farm than just growing salad greens and tomatoes, I think for us is also really a really rewarding part of it. And that's, Part of the reason why we have a couple hogs and some, some laying hens, and that's why we do the mushrooms, is having, you know, being a place where you want to attract your customers to and, and inspire a sense of community, it's a lot easier to do when you have all these, all these different facets of the farm rather than just one, you know, one major crop or, or so. So how do the laying hens fit into your operation? How many of those do you guys have? Yeah, we have about a hundred and... 30 or so laying hens. Um, we're pasturing them. They're really a, a, a really big side part of our farm. Um, I wouldn't say laying hens at this scale is really profitable. Um, I, wouldn't, I don't think we're losing money on them, but it's something we chose to do because uh, pastured eggs are something that really bring people in, and we sell produce out of our farm every Friday for a pickup. And eggs are definitely something that people will make a, a specific stop to get um, local organic pastured eggs. And although we're not making a lot of money on them, on them, uh, we really value the quality eggs as well. And it's really difficult to find out of a store. So, and like I said, uh, they are fun to have. So having some animals around is definitely a plus for our visitors, um, people who are are bringing kids along. Um, the animals are normally an attraction point as well. So, and we are utilizing them to the best of our ability to improve the land. They're being pastured on land right now that's not in vegetable production, but it, it might be in orchard production at, at one point. So, we're trying to look forward to um, forward in years to see how we can improve the land before that happens. And doing a little bit of nutrient transfer by running running that corn and soybeans through the chickens. Right. With that, I think this is a good time for us to turn to our lightning round, and we're going to get a quick word from one more sponsor, and then we'll be right back. This lightning round and perennial support for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by BCS America. A BCS two-wheel tractor is the only power equipment a market gardener will need. With PTO-driven attachments like the rototiller, the flail mower, power harrow, rotary plow, snow thrower, log splitter, and more. You name it, you can probably run it with a versatile BCS two-wheel tractor. The first time I used a rototiller, it was way back in 1991, and it was mounted to a BCS two-wheel tractor, and it spoiled me for life. When you get behind a BCS, you can tell that it's built to the same commercial standards as four-wheel farm tractors, and it has many of the same features. I've used other tillers and mowers, and I spent most of the time that I was using them thinking about how much easier things would be with a BCS. Check out bcsamerica.com to see the full lineup of tractors and attachments, plus videos of BCS in action. So, Sean, what's your favorite tool on the farm? I would definitely say uh, the Harvest Star. I kind of had the suspicion that I would really like that tool, um, but I was, um, I was, I've always been in charge of the salad greens harvest, and I've, I did a lot of harvesting uh, on my hands and knees with the knives, and then a lot of harvesting punched over with the quick cut harvester, and. Uh, Moving over to the Harvest Star to an upright, efficient harvest was really a joy for me. So I would definitely say, based off of how much salad we're harvesting, the Harvest Star Harvester is my favorite. Your farm is named Vitruvian Farms. What is Vitruvian? Yeah, so going back to when we started it, kind of straight out of college, and we were thinking about starting it kind of our last years. 
we wanted something that sounded unique, something that sounded different. I think there's a lot of similarly named farms, something that would stand out. And we were kind of inspired by um, the Renaissance and the classical period. We were looking for, you know, being part of the, the local food movement. And uh, Vitruvian just kind of crossed our minds. Um, the first thing you think about is the Vitruvian Man, the drawing by Leonardo da Vinci. And that's the, the, the long-haired man that's circumscribed in a circle and a square. Right. And Leonardo da Vinci was trying to draw a man in perfect proportions, the man in, in balance. And he was, he was, was doing this inspired by the words of, uh, of a philosopher named Vitruvius, who lived in the first century BC in Rome. He was an architect. And Vitruvius thought that human work need to embody the, be- the, the values of balance and beauty. And so we kind of traced that all the way back and settled on Vitruvian farms with the intention of creating a farm that was in balance with nature and a beautiful place to, uh, to bring people to. Well, and you mentioned being in balance with nature. Do you feel like you've got a life in balance running a farm? That, yeah, that's been its own challenge uh, for sure. And it's, starting a farm has definitely been a major character builder. And I think that there were a lot of really difficult points. And I, it seems that we're, we're through most of those. Um, and we're kind of at the point now where we're, we're able to look back and, and really appreciate how difficult it's been because it really makes us value what we're doing here. Um, and it's been a constant evolution of uh, understanding why we're doing this and what we're doing it for that I hope keeps growing. This doesn't feel like a lightning round question, but do you have a family? I have a significant other. So no, no, no uh, family and kids yet. And is your significant other involved in the farming operation? She actually uh, manages the bees on the farm. So we have a, uh, we have a, uh, Six beehives, and she helps with that. Helps create some some gardens for the bees, and she has been known to to help out from time to time. And Sean, what's your favorite crop to grow? I would say anything that right now, anything that grows on a tree. (laughs) Just so you know, salad mix does not grow on a tree. (laughs) Right. It's probably because I don't have a ton of experience with trees right now, so they're just really interesting and not at all difficult or a part of you know any any sort of labor that I don't want to do. But I'm just really intrigued with trees, and uh, I would say if I and if I had to pick one, I would say the pawpaw tree. <laughs> all right, which is which is a good one just for its name alone. Yeah, we haven't talked a lot about Tommy's role on the farm, but let me just ask. Your partner, Tommy, what's his farming superpower? Tommy's farming superpower is um, attention to detail and management. I would say he's really focused on he's really focused on creating a quality product. He's, he's really focused on creating an efficient system. I think a lot of times I'll come out of the blue with an idea, some sort, something that m- might seem a little crazy at first, some new venture. We, we should start growing oyster mushrooms or we should start an orchard. And over time, I think Tommy um, really finds out how to make that into an efficient, profitable part of our business. And how awesome to have somebody like that as your partner on the farm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And finally, Sean, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? It would be that it is going to be a lot harder than you think it is. Sean, thank you so much for being part of the Farmer to Farmer podcast today. Thanks for having me. All right, so wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 137 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast. You can find the notes for this show at farmertofarmerpodcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Kuhn. That's K-U-H-N. The transcript for this episode is brought to you by Earth Tools, offering the most complete selection of walk-behind farming equipment and high-quality garden tools in North America. And by Rock Dust Local, the first company in North America specializing in local sourcing and delivery of the best rock dust and biochar for organic farming. And by Local Food Marketplace, providing an integrated 
scalable solution for farms and food hubs to process customer orders, including online ordering, harvesting, packing, delivery, invoicing, and payment processing. Additional funding for transcripts is provided by North Central SARE, providing grants and education to advance innovations in sustainable agriculture. You can get the show notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast in your inbox by signing up for my email newsletter at farmertofarmerpodcast.com. Also, please head on over to iTunes, leave us a review if you enjoy the show, or talk to us in the show notes, or tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. And hey, when you talk to our sponsors, please let them know how much you appreciate their support of a resource you value. You can support the show directly by going to farmertofarmerpodcast.com slash donate. I'm working to make the best farming podcast in the world, and you can help. Thank you for everybody that's gone there and done that. Finally, please let me know who you would like to hear from on the show through the suggestions form at farmertofarmerpodcast.com, and I will do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running.